Yeah, it works. Cool. All right, just making sure. Um, well, uh, we uh, this this morning we have our our new youth pastor, Jacob Roder is going to going to or uh, Jacob Rader is is going to share go. is going to share with us this morning. Got it. And uh, and so uh, we we're really excited. A couple of months ago, we were looking through um, uh, doing you know doing resumes and making phone calls and all that. And we got off the phone with this guy after our, after our phone interview. And we we did we did a bunch. And we got off the phone. And I looked at Hud and I was like, you know what? I'd hire this guy right now if we could. If we didn't have to bring him in and we didn't have to have everybody. I was like, this is. I think this is the guy. And we were super excited. And he's been here about three weeks. I guess this is your third week. Yep. And so it's been great getting to know him. We're super excited about what God is going to do through him. And so uh, you guys, make him feel welcome. He's going to share God's word with us this morning. Yeah. Oh. All right. Is this, this thing good? We're good? All right. So yeah, as Jay said, my name is Jacob. I am the new youth pastor here at the Crossing Church, and I'm so, so excited to be here with you guys this morning. This morning, I want to take, uh, take an opportunity just to share a little bit of my story with you and to share a little bit about what God has taught me uh, over, over the course of my life with him. All right, so for those of you that don't know me, I grew up in a small town in Indiana called Mishawaka. Uh, you probably never heard of it. We're about 10 or 15 minutes away from Notre Dame. So if you're an Irish fan or anything, you might have heard of us before. But uh, other than that, there's nothing I can really say about my hometown. That's it. We're not that exciting. And, you know, growing up, growing up, my family, we went to church when I was little. Uh, we went to church until I, about, until I was about eight or nine when I got older. Uh, I started playing baseball. I started playing golf. started playing basketball. started playing football. So I was always, you know, on the ball field, at a golf course, or something on the weekends. Church just wasn't a thing that we could do. It wasn't a thing that um, I really wanted at the time. It wasn't a thing that was important. Uh, but I do remember going to church every once in a while. We went on Christmas, and uh, we went on Easter when I could remember, or when we remembered to. And, you know, that led to pretty much my only good memories of the church being that it was a place with candles that I was always afraid I was going to get burnt by. Songs that I kind of understood, but not really, and something weird called Advent that I never actually understood. But you know, I actually do have one memory. I have one memory of a church, one memory of a youth group. It was around when I was eight or nine years old, and I heard a knock at our front door, and being the good eight or nine-year-old that I was, I opened the door without my parents there, or even asking them. I said, hey, what's up? I think, I think that's what I said. I said, hey, my name's Jacob, and he said, hi, I'm from a church down the way. Here's a card. I'd love, love it if you and your family could could join us at some time. So, you know, I gave my mom the flyer, the card, or whatever he handed me, and we went to church, and we pulled, we got in, we walked through the doors, and the guy saw, found us. He saw us. He came over. He said, hey, I'm going to take you over with the other kids and the other students. I was like, um, okay, I'll go with you. And he took me in. I remember, giant whiteboard on the front room, or front of the room. It said, army on the left, navy on the right. All of the kids had war face paint on. Nerf guns in the air, Bibles, Nerf gun in one hand, Bible in the other, and I was like, I do not look like this. I am terrified out of my mind. And I remember sitting there thinking, okay, when is this over? I want to leave. And uh, there was a time where they, they shared the gospel. They, they shared the gospel and they said, if any of you uh, need, need to accept Jesus into your hearts right now with eyes, eyes closed, heads bowed, uh, just raise your hand, we'll have a personal conversation with you. I remember hearing that, and I was like, that might be my way out of here. So I raised my hand, they took me out, and I remember they called my family over, they're like, your son's committed his life to Jesus. And I was like, yeah, I definitely know what that means. <laughs> definitely did that. That was my experience with the church. Well, to fast forward us a little bit to high school and college. Uh, going into college, I knew I wanted two things. I wanted to be a biomedical engineer. I wanted to play golf. You guys can tell how the first one went. Not very well. But you see, as I was going through college, I was recruited almost exclusively by Christian universities. And I actually made a commitment to go to one of them. It was a small university called Spring Arbor in Jackson, Michigan. About two or three weeks before we graduated, right before all the deadlines for admission ended, I had a nervous breakdown one morning sitting at my dining room table eating breakfast. I remember my mom came over and she said, are, are you okay? I had a complete nervous breakdown. Because I said, no. I said, I'm freaked out. Their engineering program is brand new and be part of the first class. What if it fails? What if I can't get a job? What if employers don't like it? 
So this golf program, I have cerebral palsy on my left side. We had to do workouts every day at 5 a.m. We had to do two a days in the off season. I was like, what if my body can't handle it? Then there was another thing. You see, I didn't want to go to chapel two or three times a week. See, I didn't want to have to take classes on the New Testament and the Old Testament. I didn't want to have to do a Bible study with my teammates. I didn't want to have to include God in my life. So I made an email. I sent some emails and some text messages out that morning to the only non-Christian university that recruited me. And they, they emailed me back about an hour later saying, you can still get in. In fact, we'll give you the last male bed in the honors housing, which was the only housing I was going to be willing to switch for. And I got in the last possible day I could. Or at least that's what it felt like. And see, at that secular university, I was studying with one of my friends for a calculus quiz. For any students in the room, I'm sorry. It was like the second week of school. Quizzes and tests come fast in college. You'll get used to it. But we were talking, and she, she looked at me, and she goes, do you go to worships? I go. I said, well, you know, I've been meaning. I was lying to her completely. I said, you know, I've been meaning to, but I've been busy with golf. I've been busy with this. I've been busy with that. I'll get there eventually. Like, I, I'll get there. And she said, well, you're coming with me next week. This was a Wednesday afternoon. Our worship services on campus were Tuesday nights. It's like, sweet, she's got an entire week to forget. <laughs> she didn't forget. No, I, got, I, come, I came out of practice that Tuesday. And I looked at my phone to a text message that said, meet me in the lobby at 645. We're walking over to worship together. She drugged me there that week, the week after that, the week after that. Then finally, the guys in the ministry took me under their wing. They started to mentor me, and they made sure that I never left. See, November 2019, my freshman year, I committed my life to Christ and was baptized, actually understanding what that meant that time. Since then, God's helped me overcome anger, depression, worry, and doubt about myself, surroundings, even reminding me and showing me what forgiveness and love and sacrifice actually mean, even showing me how my family, how my parents instilled that in me without me even knowing, without me being in the church. But you see, as I look back on my story, there's one lesson, one lesson that has repeatedly been drilled into me by God over and over and over again, and that's how to trust in him. That's what trust in him actually means, even when I was running away from him. Even when I didn't, even when I changed majors from biomedical engineering to math because I thought that'd be more fun and now I'm a minister. Because God has a very interesting sense of humor. Even when I was taking a step of faith and saying, you know what? I've tried. I've tried golf internships. I've tried math internships. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try ministry. I jumped into ministry last year. I've never left since. He showed me what trust in him actually means. You see, one of my largest goals as your guys' youth pastor over there is to help students take their next steps toward authentic relationship with and trust in Jesus Christ. And for all of us this morning, I don't care where you are. I don't care if you've been following Jesus for two days, two hours, or 25 years. That's where our faith comes from. Trust in him, a relationship of trust, is where we see God move in unexpected ways. Trust is how we reach a world extremely desperate for the gospel, extremely desperate for the good news of Jesus Christ with that good news. It's not from your own power. It's not from who you are. It's from who God is in a relationship of trust in him. Trust is important, but the question is how? How do we trust in God? And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. Before we get going, I'd love to pray and ask God for his help, so if you'd pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be with you. I thank you for this opportunity for us to dive into your word and uh, understand what you say about trust, God. And I pray that whoever is in this room right now that needs to hear something, God, let every person hear exactly what they need to hear. Father, give me the words to say. Let the Spirit speak through me. Let this be your message and not mine. Help us all to grow closer to you and grow in trust in you today. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So as I think about my own story, as I think about how God has built trust in my life, there's one thing that immediately jumps out to me, and that is the church. That's my faith family, the family of believers that came around me at that college campus and made sure I never left and made sure that I was in the right place for God to do what only God could do. They built my trust by sharing stories of God's faithfulness, how God has come through for them in their own life. 
Maybe when I was a young Christian, they reminded me that, you know what, it's hard right now. I don't know what's going on, but God is always working and you will see it pay off in the future. Sometimes it was just a reminder that trust in God was even an option in the first place. But you see, the thing is, and I've seen this in my own life, the value of the faith family, the value of our unity toward building trust and how it helps us build trust is something that I've forgotten so often. I feel, and I feel that it's something that all of us forget. The value of our faith family, the value of our unity and how that helps us build trust is something that we forget a lot. Maybe we don't pay attention to it. Maybe we take it for granted. But you see, this wasn't Jesus's intention. No, in fact, our unity, our faith family and how that looks different from the world around us, how that can help us build trust, it was extremely important to him. I wanna jump into John chapter 17 with you guys. It says this. It says, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. See, this section of scripture, it comes from the prayer that Jesus prayed the night before he was betrayed in the garden. One of the last things on his mind is son praying through the spirit to the father, saying, I want them to have the unity that we have, the un." imaginable, uncomprehendable unity that the three of us have. I want them to have that. It's one of the last things on his mind. But how often, if ever, is that the case for us? See, because when I wake up, when I pray, when I go through my day, my primary concern isn't normally the unity of my faith family around me. No, it's usually my own family, my job. Maybe for some of you, it's your kids small group, the world's leaders, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's for that person that you've been praying for to come to know Jesus in personal relationship. And you see, none of those things, none of them are bad. We should be praying for every single one of those. But more likely than not, the unity of our faith family should be higher on all of our lists because it's radically different than anything that the world can offer, and that's how it builds our trust in God. The unity that the faith family is supposed to have is different in love. It's different in sacrifice. It's different in commitment. It's different in support. It's different in every possible way. And not only does that show the world around us who God is, not only does that show the world around us why they should come to Jesus because they're missing something, it shows us trust in God because trust is built when we realize that even though even though that love is so different than the world around us, even though that support is different than anything we could imagine, even though that sacrifice is different than anything we could imagine, it's still nothing compared to what God himself wants to provide you with in a personal relationship with you. See, because within the context of this faith family, we realize pretty quickly, I know I realized it in my own life, that we need deep personal relationship with God. And it doesn't matter where you are this morning. It doesn't matter if you've been with God for 20 years. It doesn't matter if you don't know who God is. He wants a deeper personal relationship with you. Even if you have one right now, he wants it to be deeper. He wants it to be more intimate. He wants it to be closer. Because you see, to build trust, we have to have a deep personal relationship. Because trust, it's not something that happens secondhand. See, I said that the faith family helped me build trust by hearing stories of God's faithfulness in other people's lives, but those stories don't build my trust. It's not their relationship that builds my trust or your trust. Trust in God doesn't come from listening to worship songs without a relationship. Trust in God doesn't come from just listening to a Christian podcast. Trust doesn't come from listening to a sermon on a Sunday. Trust comes from personal relationship because trust is hard. Trust is relational and it has to be your relationship, all of those things help build trust. But none of them on their own build trust if God and you don't have a relationship. True trust in God can only come 
through personal relationship with him. And you see, this personal relationship is something that Jesus stressed and emphasized many different times in his ministry. See, in Matthew chapter 7, he says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You see, then again, in Matthew chapter 10, he says this. He says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown them before my Father in heaven. I don't know about you, but these verses always convict me. Because they remind me that Jesus is calling us to a deep, personal, real relationship with him. A relationship that goes beyond Sundays. A relationship that goes with us to our schools. A relationship that goes with us to our workplace. A relationship that goes with us to the grocery store. A relationship that goes with us on the highway when the guy cuts us off and we're very angry. And we want to scream probably non-Christian things. A relationship that goes with us everywhere. A relationship that has effort and dedication. A relationship that we have something in. A real relationship. A real one that includes time spent, that we're invested in, that we desire. Because you know, sometimes, sometimes when our trust isn't really there, I know in my own life, when I'm struggling to trust in God, it's not because He's changed, it's not because God's any different, but it's because my distance to Him is different. It's not because he's gotten farther away. It's not because he's changed. It's not because he's left. It's because I've left. It's because my distance from him is not what it should be. So this morning, as we think about our own trust in God, there's a question we all need to ask ourselves, and it's this. Where is our relationship with him? Where is it? Because I know that sometimes it's incredibly easy for us to just go through the motions and fake it. See, when I think about what this means, what this looks like, you might be thinking, well, what do you mean? What does it look like to fake it? Think of the Gospel of Matthew. I think of Jesus sitting around the table with his disciples at the Last Supper. And I think of him saying, truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. And I think of how none, not a single one of the disciples sat there and said, it's Judas, it's him. I knew it. No, their response is truly, Lord, it's not me. You don't mean me, right? They didn't even know if it was them. See, Judas walked with them for three and a half years with Jesus in the presence of God every single day, and none of them knew because Jesus was a master of fake. Judas was a master at faking his faith. Absolute master. And I feel like sometimes it's the temptation from the enemy to do the same. You see, only you and God will ever know if your relationship is real. Only you and God are ever gonna know if you can have true trust or if you have true trust. This morning, ask yourself. I know I have to ask it every day and I know it's a hard question. Sometimes it hurts. It's my distance to him where it needs to be. If you're thinking about that this morning, there's one last thing that we can think about. And it's this, that a true authentic relationship of trust in God, it's naturally gonna lead to something and that's service within the church. It's service to other people. Because you see, there's nothing, there's nothing that builds trust quicker than serving and living as the church right now, especially when you have absolutely nothing left to give. There's nothing that builds our trust in God like seeing him come through in the, through the Holy Spirit working inside of us to do things that we could only imagine that were possible. I want to take you guys on a story to middle school camp. Last summer, it was my first summer working in student ministry, and I had so much to learn that I did not know I needed to learn. (laughs) 
We took about 250 middle schoolers to camp for a week in Michigan. And each of us got seven middle schoolers. And we were paired with another seven for 14 in one cabin. We were with the students for 23.25 hours a day. We got 45 minutes to ourselves. And I was told before I went that week that you're not going to get much sleep. And I, I, I believed them, but I didn't know how much I needed to believe them. You see, we got there, and I, in my mind, I was thinking, I'm young. I can handle this. I can go on no sleep. I can handle middle schoolers. It'll be great. It'll be fun. And after about the second day, maybe the first, I don't really remember, I was done. <laughs> I needed sleep. I needed time to call home. I needed that 45 minutes. When we got the full 45 minutes was not enough. I remember looking up at the sky while the students were in Bible quiz. I had run back the half mile back to the camp to be able to take a shower with no students around. I ran back to go to Bible, or to pick them up from Bible quiz. And I remember looking at the sky saying, God, I can't get through the next four days without you. I can't, I have nothing left. I can't do it. And you see, in those next four days, I've had some of the best spiritual conversation with students that I've ever had. Not by my own power, but by the power of the Spirit working inside of me, coming to him and saying, God, I can't do this without you. I need you. I've never seen my trust build so quickly. I've never seen my trust in God skyrocket the way that it did that week. And you see, for all of us counselors, there was a set of verses that became our anthem, became what we relied on the entire time, and it comes from the the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, they say this. They say, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. And for some of you this morning, you might be where I've been. You might be where my students have been. You're saying, you know what? I'm part of a Christ-centered faith family. I read my Bible. I pray. I listen to worship music. I listen to a Christian podcast. I'm confident that I have a relationship with God. And you know what? I serve. I give. I'm part of the church right now, but those two verses, yeah, I struggle with those. I struggle to lean on my under, or God's understanding and not my own. I still struggle to trust him despite the fact that I still do those three things. I have a personal relationship. I know Jesus. I'm a part of the church. I'm a part of the faith family. But it's still hard to trust and This morning, I want to encourage you and say, that's okay. Remember, trust is hard. Trust is relational. Relationships aren't easy. Sometimes our trust might waver a little. But there's one thing this morning that all of us need to understand. There's one thing that makes living out our trust in God and actually believing it with our hearts a lot easier. It's something that I pray that all of our students over in that student center graduate, not only knowing but believing because you see, I don't really care how much my students know up here if they don't know it in here. Head knowledge means absolutely nothing without heart knowledge. And I pray that all of them know this in their hearts, that trusting God means surrendering your needs to know why and faithfully doing things that might only make sense in reverse. See, leaning not on my own understanding means, God, I don't need to know why anymore. I'm going to focus on your understanding because I know that your thoughts are not my thoughts. I know that your ways are not my ways. I don't know what this is going to do. It might not make sense for a week. It might not make sense for a month. It might not make sense for a year. It might never make sense, but I'm going to trust you because that is what my life is built on. You see, I've seen this in my own life in a college decision, going to an only secular university that I was interested in to find Jesus there. Changing degrees from engineering to math and now being in ministry. Or taking a step of faith and saying, God, I've gone literally everywhere else in the world that I could think of to work. 
and it hasn't fulfilled me. So God, I'm gonna take a step and apply for this internship at a church. And I don't know if it's the right thing, but it's what I feel you calling me to do. And I might not understand it for a little while and I understand it perfectly now. And as you think about surrendering this morning, there's one other thing that we have to do and that's this. So you have to understand that surrendering our needs to know why, it also means accepting that our why might not match God's why. You see, I wanna take you back to middle school camp. That summer I was preparing an apologetics course for my campus ministry for my last semester. I knew why. I was like, God, the ministry has been struggling with apologetics. We live, we're on an engineering campus, a scientifically minded campus. We need to reach students. We need to. That's why you have me doing this. And I remember that first night, I had a conversation with some of my students in my cabin. And they told me, hey, we got our friend to come. And he's actually an atheist. He has no belief in God. He didn't want to come. We only got him to come because of the games. And I looked up at the sky, read my Bible that night, said, God, I guess my why was wrong. I guess my why wasn't your why. And praise be to God that he used me as his vessel that week to bring that student to Christ. And praise be to God even more that that student is still a part of that faith family back at that church back home. So whatever you need to surrender this morning, whether it's an illness, job struggles, family struggles, relationship struggles, sickness, hardship, trials, broken relationships, expectations. I don't know what it is for the students. Maybe it's transition from middle school to high school, high school to college. Parents, maybe it's just something hard there. But I invite you this morning to give it to God. The front's open. There'll be people at the crosses on either side you want to be prayed for or be prayed with. But there's peace available. There's peace that transcends all understanding available through trust in God. I invite you, I beg you, surrender your need to know why through whatever challenging circumstance it is this morning. Surrender it to God, lay it at the foot of the cross and say, God, I can't bear this on my own. You'd say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Trust in God and find that rest this morning. Let me pray for you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word, God, and I pray, Father, that you would help all of us to trust in you more. Father, I pray that you would help all of us to know what that trust truly brings and to know what that trust truly means. Father, wherever we are, help us take our next step toward an authentic relationship with you a real relationship that changes lives. It's in your son's holy, precious, and perfect name. Amen. We're gonna sing another song, you guys.